This is our uh, Simon Doe reading group. We're continuing our reading of imagination and invention. Uh, so we're on page 41 of the translation at the beginning of section B of uh, chapter one, part one. Um, so last time we looked at, or the last couple of sessions, we looked at uh, section A, uh, which has to do with the, um, he's going through this cycle of the image that we looked at in the, uh, in the introduction. So he's going through the first phase of the first level of that cycle. So this is um, uh, the image prior to the experience of the object. So this is um, the first phase. Uh, and then the first level is the biological level. So he talks about uh, the sort of priority of motricity over sensoriality is, is his terminology. So uh, he looks at, for example, uh, single-celled organisms have this um, sort of quasi-Brownian motion. So they, they just sort of move around in a fluid in more or less random um, uh, motion, uh, which is in, in that kind of environment is actually an efficient way of exploring an environment to, uh, to find sources of nutrition or, or whatever other um, properties of an environment that those organisms need. Uh, and then he looks at uh, uh, the sort of species characteristic actions for a particular kind of organism. So, uh, organisms, uh, animals in particular, have uh, behaviors that are specific to that species of the animal. Uh, so in the same way that you can classify an animal based on the shape of its uh, uh, foot or teeth or whatever, um, you can also classify animals based on the, the type of behavior that they have. So the, a specific way of eating, a specific way of walking or flying or whatever, um, these are characteristic of a species of animals. Uh, and then he looked at um, the coordination of actions. Uh, and so this was uh, connected with the sort of um, the aspects of the environment that are necessary to uh, release a certain kind of action. So uh, this is something that was studied a lot in early 20th century ethology. Uh, so the study of animal behavior, um, for example, um, uh, certain birds like uh, geese or chickens will follow their mother after they hatch but um, the sort of pattern of what the mother has to look like is very vague and abstract so essentially any sort of moving object of roughly the right size uh, sort of fills the requirements to be a mother uh, for the the chick that has just hatched so they, they might follow a dog or a person um, uh, after hatching and um, yeah so the the sort of mother pattern can be fulfilled by any object that moves and has sort of roughly the right shape uh, the right size uh, very roughly in the case of a, a human um, and then there's this weird bit where he talks about Jung's uh, uh, hypothesis that um, uh, certain images have, that humans use uh, like the image of a dragon for example would be sort of evolutionarily preserved um, um, like uh, images from earlier, from ancestors of human beings. So like early mammals that had experience of dinosaurs, for example, and then this sort of image of the reptile, the giant reptile would be like preserved in our human uh, sort of collective unconscious. And Simon Don thinks this is uh, sort of an interesting hypothesis, but probably not, um, uh, not sufficient or not uh, uh, entirely correct. Uh, and he talks about the images of flight that humans have. So there's many uh, legends and historical uh, reports of people that tried to develop flying apparatus, uh, mostly in the form of uh, like wings you would attach your, your arms to. Um, and uh, Yes, and, and so these th there's this sort of image of flight, or and then many people also have dreams of flying. Uh, again, this, this is sort of an image of flight that we uh, that we have, uh, of course, without any experience of flying. Uh, and so for Simon Don, um, he suggests that this may, um, rather than being some sort of uh, evolutionarily preserved image, it's more likely that it's um, through observation of birds and then sort of a subjective transposition so you sort of imagine yourself into the flight of a bird and and this is where that image comes from uh, and then he also in a, a later bit i think that we saw you last time he he talks about the uh 
experience of the a fetus in the womb of uh, sort of floating in amniotic fluid as an, another potential source for the the uh, image of of flight and and floating freely. Um, let's see what was the next bit. Uh, right, and then the the next section was on. Um, this sort of spontaneous development of um, motor behavior uh, during the development of an individual organism. So uh, this is something that he he talked about in uh, more detail in the the text um, form information potentials that we read at the end of uh, individuation volume two. Um, but uh, in the case of human uh, infants, as they develop, they uh, they have one sort of phase of action in which they use crawling as their way of getting around the world. Um, so um, in the first few months of uh, a human infant's life, um, they will crawl around and they're capable of, you know, getting around, uh, you know, a variety of environments with uh, pretty good speed and coordination and so on. Uh, but then after a certain amount of time, the crawling starts to become awkward and um, uh, sort of stopped working properly and there's a sort of disorganization of that motor schema or motor um, pattern of crawling. Uh, and then after maybe a few weeks or, or so, the, the disorganized crawling turns into walking on two feet instead of crawling on all fours. Uh, so there's this sort of uh, pattern of uh, well-adapted uh, behavior that becomes disorganized uh, in, in a sort of transitional period and then uh, produces a new well-adapted behavior uh, at a, a higher level of organization. Uh, and, and so there's these uh, sort of motor um, images or these, uh, 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 yeah, these motor images that um, sort of correspond to these different behaviors. And we see this in uh, lots of animals with uh, various forms of play. Uh, so he talks about cats that will um, use a, a ball of yarn or, or anything that has like a vaguely spherical shape um, and roughly the right size, they will use it as a, a sort of a counterpart to this action of uh, uh, grasping and, and attacking prey. Um, and, uh, and so this action uh, is part of the development of cat behavior uh, and the object that corresponds to it only has to have a very abstract sort of uh, set of features that allow it to serve as a, a play object. Uh, and then he, he, there's an interesting bit about um, human children playing with dolls. Uh, and he talks about how um, adults who don't really understand this play behavior sometimes think that, you know, the doll should resemble uh, a human baby as much as possible. It should have like anatomically correct uh, features and, um, Maybe it should be able to move and, and things like that. Uh, uh, but this is actually not really what the child that plays with the doll wants or um, what what the purpose of a doll is. The doll just has to um, have the sort of appropriate capacity to um, uh, be a counterpart to the actions of, of the child, like picking up uh, the doll, um, carrying it, cradling it, and so on. Um, and so like a bundle of rags that has like a vaguely human form is is just as good as this anatomically accurate uh, doll or, or it can be even better if the if the accurate doll is one that uh, doesn't afford the same types of actions. Uh, and then we saw um, a section on what what Simon Don calls sympathetic induction. So th this is um, a, a kind of behavior that is uh, released by uh, observing other animals or other organisms performing that same behavior. So he talks about uh, chickens that are fed uh, up to the point where they don't don't eat anymore. And then they're um, allowed to see other chickens eating and then that makes them start eating again. Uh, so, and again, the, the eating behavior of the chicken is not something that the chicken has to learn how to, how to do. Um, like they, they, from hatching, they're capable of um, pecking at seeds or whatever other sort of food that is lying on the ground. So they don't need to learn that behavior, but they um, they sort of imitate that behavior. Uh, well, and I shouldn't say imitate because Simon Don uses uh, that word for learned behavior, but um, they uh, that behavior is released in a chicken when it observes another chicken performing that behavior. Uh, and then I think the last section we looked at was uh, this idea of the body schema uh, and the 
the relation between motor images and the body schema. So the body schema is uh, sort of our internal experience of our own body as capable of action. Uh, so uh, you you have a, a sort of uh, experience of your body as capable of uh, walking or jumping or picking up a book or whatever other set of actions that you can perform. Uh, so you, you sort of have a, an inner experience of that um, capacity for action in your body. And uh, this can, of course, change over time, you know, as your body uh, grows from childhood into adulthood. Uh, and then potentially, uh, in the case of uh, amputations, for example, you have to learn that you no longer have a, a hand. Uh, and, and so you don't try to reach for things with the hand that's missing, for example. Uh, or, um, you know, as you get older, your capacity to um, uh, run or stretch and or you know, perform actions uh, gradually diminishes. And so your, your sort of um, schema of what types of actions are possible will change over time as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's, um, and, and he also points out uh, in connection with uh, Goldstein's work that um, this set of actions that the body schema corresponds to is, it's not, um, it's not a sort of uh, atomic composition of individual actions. Like it's the whole, body schema that sort of uh, responds to the situation uh, in which the body is is found. Uh, so, for example, in the case of uh, someone who suffers brain damage as a result of an injury or a stroke or, or something, um, they might no longer be able to perform. They might not be able to write, for example. Uh, but then after a while, maybe a few months, a few years, they're able to recover at least some ability to write. Um, so the it, it's not that there's like you know a section of their brain that is devoted to writing, and if that section of the brain is damaged, then they completely lose the ability to write. Instead, it's uh, there's a sort of um, total organization of the organism that allows for writing, uh, and then it can suffer damage uh, that that um, uh, eliminates or or reduces that ability to write. Uh, but then it can also uh, sort of undergo relearning of how to write or reorganization um, and and then uh, recover at least some ability to write. Uh, and so this is sort of uh, characteristic of the relationship between particular motor images and the body schema in general. So it's not, uh, again, it's not like there's individual images that sort of join together to form a, a body schema. It's uh, the body schema as a whole uh, that... Um, is related to these various motor images. And then there was this one, maybe the last thing I'll mention is this interesting bit about this example that he gives of the airplane and how we sort of uh, imagine the behavior of an airplane or the, the motion of an airplane. And so he, he says like to, to imagine or to have a, a concrete image of the, uh, of the motion of an object uh, or the functioning of an object in general, we have to sort of imagine ourselves into that object and so in the case of the airplane, uh, we can easily do this or, or relatively easily do this in the case of the airplane taking off from the ground. So we, we can sort of picture ourselves running along the landing strip as fast as we can and then sort of jumping into the air. Uh, and this corresponds to uh, a set of motor uh, behaviors that uh, the human body is capable of, you know, running and, and then jumping over an obstacle, for example. Uh, but then he says that the uh, sort of counterpart or the other uh, of the airplane's motion, the landing is much harder to imagine. We don't have a, a motor schema or a motor, uh, a set of motor behaviors in, in the human body that corresponds to sort of approaching the ground from above and slowing down and, and uh, you know, finding the right angle and so on. So this is uh, much harder for us to um, sort of imagine. And I think uh, just on like statistics of um, uh, Air, air traffic accidents, I think landing is, is one of the more um, dangerous parts of the flight. It's, it's the one where more accidents happen. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and so that could be related to this you know, difficulty of imagining or of uh, understanding the, the action of landing a plane. Uh, so that's, that's what we saw the last couple of weeks. Uh, and then we'll pick up on the continuing on um, the first phase, but now at the second level, so uh, the psychical level of anticipation.
Uh, so I'll ask for a uh, volunteer to read, uh, let's see, yeah, the first uh, page or so. I could do it. It's from section B. Yes. Mm -hmm. Images in states of expectation uh, and anticipation. The preceding description of the organic conditions of anticipation of perception and action shows that for behavior as a whole, the perspectives of an unexpected future are as important as present givens or the repercussions of experience in the form of memory. The same character of a projective logic of anticipation shows up in the dynamic of states of expectation and anticipation in the subject, at a level that can be called psychic. The use of the word psychic to characterize a level is a delicate one. Perhaps it would be better to call it secondary in opposition to primary. To avoid confusion, we will say that the psychic level corresponds to a mode of functioning of the organism that does not involve the organism as a whole in a situation, but primarily calls upon the nervous system and the sensory organs. As such, the psychic level of activity refers to a milieu already explored and organized in a biological mode. That is to say, it, refer, it refers to a territory. Psychic categories and activities are not in opposition to primary activities. They follow them and presuppose that the milieu has been invented, uh, inventory, inventoried and classified according to primary categories. Defense, attack, prey, predator, etc. In order to be exercised, confronted by an unknown situation, the subject first falls back on an activity from the primary level. Then, when the milieu has become a territory, the organized environment is processed in the secondary, psychic mode, which means that the subject has passed from situations to objects. Finally, the logical or formal mode appears when objects are taken to be the frames or supports for relations, which implies they were identified at, at the secondary level according to the perceptual motor categories of common action. Yeah, that's a good place to stop, thanks. Yeah, so this is sort of the introduction to section B, so the second level. And, and so we saw in, in the introduction already, he, he's um, a little bit, um, uh, how should I put it? Um, he's not entirely satisfied with the, the terminology of uh, the psychic level um, or the, for this, this second level of, uh, of the cycle of the image. Uh, so he talks, he, here he says maybe we should just say primary and secondary instead. Uh, but he does continue to use this this term, the psychical level. Um, and so what this corresponds to, uh, he, he already explained this a little, a little bit in the introduction, but what this corresponds to is uh, a level of response to the environment in which it's no longer the whole organism that responds. Uh, so at the what he calls the biological level or the primary level, the organism either um, attacks or runs away or engages in a mating uh, ritual or something that involves the whole organism, like the organism as a whole responds to the environment. Whereas at the secondary or psychical level, it's uh, he, he says it's a sort of a nervous system level response. So um, here we have uh, the the organism uh, has a, a sort of partial response, and in particular, as as we um, go along, we'll see that uh, this allows for the capacity to sort of weigh different images against each other or, or weigh different courses of action or different responses to the environment against each other. Uh, so an organism that is capable of uh, acting at this second level or responding at this second level um, to something in the environment is capable not just of a sort of automatic response to uh, some feature of the environment with uh, you know an attack or flight behavior, but is capable of um, Sort of a differentiated response to the uh, to the, this feature of the environment, and and can sort of compare multiple aspects of the environment and sort of make a decision um, that might be sort of too anthropomorphic, uh, but a description of what exactly is going on. But um, in general, the organism is capable of weighing different sources of of information, and then. Uh, uh, responding in a way that sort of incorporates those different sources of information. So that's what the psychical level in general consists in. And we're going to be looking at uh, how this uh, first phase of, of that level, so the, uh, the phase that occurs before the encounter with the object um, or the sort of anticipatory phase, we're going to look at that um, phase at the second level, uh, the, the psychical level. Okay. If there are no other questions or comments, we can go on to the next um, section if someone else can.
Yeah, let's, let's read just one page. We'll, we'll break up this subsection in parts. From phobias? Uh, yes. Uh, I got you. Uh, phobias and compulsive variations, the amplifying character and expectation. A phobia, properly speaking, is a morbid fear of certain objects, actions, or situations. Agoraphobia clause. This phenomenon occurs in attenuated fashion in ordinary psychic life. During ontogenesis, the hereditary coordinations of action like flight, disgust, rejection, recruit objects that may be selected either by certain conditions of individual experience or by call modality. Hence, for our ancestors, snakes and occasion cute exhibition of disgust. In Sleeping Beauty, Perrault imagines a torture ordained by an ogress, throwing the queen and her children into a vat full of vipers, snakes, and serpents. Because of a fortunate twist, the arrival of the king, the ogress, enraged her vengeance cannot be carried out, throws herself headfirst into the vat, and is devoured in it by the evil beasts she has. Such beliefs obviously cannot rest on perceptuals. They can only result from a mental activity perceptual dissipation, prolonging the primary category in a vacuum, with no perceptual limit or controls coming from real objects. Psychic elaboration follows axisms actions. In the imaginary bestiary, there are not only repulsive animals, corresponding to disgust and vomiting, but also aggressive and devouring animals, corresponding to avoidance, and others like the imaginary salamander called breath that suffocates whoever breathes toxic solations, corresponding to suffocating and breathless. There is also, in the same imaginary category, a large caterpillar called breath that hides in the grass and kills cattle. Such beliefs are probably not gratuitous. Toads do not have venom in their epidermis, but mostly as a defensive, passive, and rather ineffic inefficacious means of warding off aggressors. The imaginary activity reveals itself through a veritable amplifactory projection of this property of having. Imaginary toads are also endowed with poisonous spit and injections of urine, burning the eyes of the... Uh, you can continue to the end of this paragraph, I think. What we have here is amplification through projection in various directions and modalities of venomous action. As for the breath of salamanders and caterpillars, it too may be based on actual incidents. Some caterpillars can cause venomous in the esophagus ingested by ruminants, and the swelling may disrupt breathing. The great fear of cattle keepers, though, is bloating, which has a very different The imaginary malfeasance of breaths that results from the efficacy and projection in various directions. The capacity to bloat and motor images as body skills or as an inner unfolding of phenomena are amplified by psychic activity, grandizes, matizes, especially projects them onto the supposed to be. These things, in fact, are foremost results of activities of amplifactory projection that characterize psychic functions and a pre is unlimited and without objective and stimulated endogenously by the force of yeah, so this, um, so again, we're we're at the psychical level now, um, and we're talking about anticipations. Um, and here, his examples are are these kind of funny um, medieval um, bestiaries. So these uh, sort of imaginary um, um, medieval animals um, um, that, in these fables and and legends, um, have these properties that, of course, the real animals don't actually have. So these toads that um spit venom or um devour the ogre for example um uh so again these are sort of uh, an externalization or projection of the motor behavior so this sort of um um the this sort of um behavior of disgust um so that you you see the toad and you have this uh sort of response of disgust and rejection and sort of um pushing the, the toad away from you, uh, this response is sort of externalized and made into an objective property of the toad itself. So the toad is, is not just something that I subjectively dislike, it's something that has this sort of uh, objectively dangerous um, uh, property of you know, spitting venom or, or devouring or, or whatever. Um, uh, and so this is what he sees, what Simon Dong here sees as, as being characteristic of this sort of um, psychical anticipation, uh, we, we sort of um, take the, um, the properties or the, 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 yeah, the properties that we attribute to an organism or to an object outside of us, and then we sort of um, externalize them onto the, uh, the, uh, the object outside of us rather than seeing it as, as um, a sort of correlate of our own behavior. Kind of interesting that he talks about this in terms of amplification. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we mentioned a few times when we were reading volume one of individuation is that 
in especially in the psychic and collective sections he doesn't give very many examples um in you know at like the physical level i think the primary example of ampli- transactive amplification is the crystal propagating through the solution but i don't think that we got a lot of examples of what amplification would look like at the psychic level but it seems like this is um one such example with the ogress from Perot and other uh, hereditary coordinations that lead to or generate these images of you know frightful creatures. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I didn't think of that. Um, yeah, so in the in individuation, he he does give us some good examples in the earlier parts of the book. The physical uh, individuation, we have the crystallization example and the brick making example, and he he sort of mines these examples for um, analogies. But then in the later parts of the book, in the psychical and collective individuation, we have, uh, it's much more abstract. Um, We have these sort of conceptual accounts of how individuation happens at these levels, but um, a lot less in the way of concrete examples of how this works. Um, But here, yeah, this um, sort of amplification, I think is, um, yeah, a good, uh, this is a good sort of example of, of that amplification in the sense that we take something that has the properties of um, a motor um, a motor image um, so this sort of repulsion that, that we feel in seeing a toad or a snake um, and and then we this uh, sort of motor image gets amplified throughout the psychical life of the individual uh, to produce this sort of fantastic image of the toad as spitting venom and devouring the ogre and so on. Yeah, I think it's interesting the, the use of the word amplified because it has two meanings, doesn't it? It has a kind of meaning of, of uh, adding something to something, but it also means uh, increasing the volume of something. And um, I think the, the second meaning for me it has, a kind of, has a kind of relevance, shall we say, to a kind of, a kind of structural idea that's, that I'm imagining might be d- being developed. Whereas the second one, obviously the kind of the ampli- it's it seems it's more to do with the amplification in which the meaning of with something meaning is is amplified, it's made larger, it's um, it's added to, it's one thing is added to another. But uh, I wonder if the the amplification of of a like the notion of a sound that comes from something else is also part of the meaning of that word. Yeah, I think um, in connection, so in volume one, he talks about amplification um, and he, oh, sorry, in, uh, in individuation volume one. Um, yeah, so he talks about amplification uh, and he's drawing on um, electronics, uh, you know, early, I guess, early electronics, uh, you know, 1950s and, and 60s electronics, um, where you can take a, a signal, um, which could be a sound signal, but also just a, an electrical signal of some kind. Um, and you can amplify it. So you can, uh, if a signal has a certain amplitude, you can multiply that amplitude using a particular um, electronic device. Um, and uh, he he sees this kind of amplification as um, um, also being at work in the case of crystallization. Uh, so you have a, a solution of some kind and you have a, a crystalline germ that has a, a certain structure. Uh, and then the process of crystallization sort of amplifies that structure um, and, you know, makes it bigger and bigger as it progressively crystallizes the solution. Uh, and, and so this, this notion of amplification is a, a sort of, um, yeah, he, so it's drawn from electronics, but um, Simon Do applies it to lots of other domains uh, where uh, some sort of um, structure or form is taken from, uh, say, a, a small germ or a weak signal and um, applied to uh, something to uh, you know structuring a whole domain, uh, a whole sort of uh, vat of solution, for example, or um, applied to a, a, a stronger signal. Uh, and uh, and so here, in the case of uh, this psychical amp- amplification, we have something. This motor image might be something that has a relatively small role in the sort of uh, motor behavior of the motor repertoire of the organism. So um, this reaction of disgust or rejection or repulsion that you might experience when seeing a toad is a a relatively small part of your overall sort of repertoire of behaviors. 
but then in this sort of phobic reaction, um, this very small um, part of your motor repertoire gets amplified so that it might, like, in, in certain cases, people that have, um, you know, phobias in the proper sense of the term, they might actually be unable to go outside of their apartment or uh, they might have a panic attack if they see a toad or, or whatever. So it, it becomes a, a much bigger part of their psychical life. Um, so, yeah, it's an amplification in, in that sense that it's uh, something small or um, relatively weak that gets um, uh, sort of multiplied in, in its size or um, amplitude to the point that it sometimes can become like the dominant portion of, uh, of a person's psychical life. Yeah, one thing that's interesting about the use of amplification here is that it seems to be um, tied to the, you know, the fact that we're in the first, I can't remember if it's phase or cycle, um, but the anticipatory a level or phase. So one of the reasons these things can be amplified so much is that they're, they precede kind of the encounter with the object. Um, and I wonder how amplification would play out at the other two stages. So the, the, the present stage of encounter with the object and then the um, reflective stage. Yeah. I'll just say, uh, stay tuned because we'll, we'll get to that. Um, or, or we'll, we'll be able to answer that question or, or see how Simondo answers that question when we get to the uh, later parts of this book. So he, he goes through anticipation at each level, and then he goes through um, the uh, encounter with the object and uh, sort of post-encounter um, reflection on the object. It seems like the what's been... Like, I take it that the, the one of the ideas of this section is that the the object hasn't been encountered. I take it that's the kind of premise that this is coming from, although I'm not totally clear on that. But it it, it appears that what's being created, if in that case, then is a completely new object. It's like a, a myth. This is where it's mythical because it's not reliant on a real thing to to be there. So it's projection onto this kind of this thing, um, which is in a, in a sense, yeah, mythical. You know. Yeah. So here in this case of the the toad. Um... Uh, yeah, it's it's a sort of mythical toad. I mean, there there are of course real toads, and Simondo mentions that they do have um, uh, a certain amount of venom that they secrete on their skin. Um, but uh, this is a, a, a again, he points this out. This is a purely defensive um, property of toads. Uh, the idea or the sort of evolutionary um, function of this secretion is that um, uh, if an animal uh, tries to eat a toad, it will get this venom, which um, I think causes it, the tongue to swell or um, anyway, causes a sort of adverse reaction in the um, animal that tries to eat a toad. And then in future, presumably this animal will uh, avoid eating toads. And like this thing that I tried to eat, you know, made me choke and have this uh, un uncomfortable experience. Um, so this is a sort of the, the real sort of kernel that is um, uh, sort of the basis for this, idea of the toad as venomous, but uh, onto this real kernel gets projected all these sort of fantastic images of, uh, yeah, the toad that spits venom and devours the ogre and, and all these other um, properties uh, that, that have to do with the motor response of repulsion, uh, as opposed to any sort of um, actual encounter with toads and, you know, observation of what their properties are. Uh, so it, again, it's probably not you know, arbitrary or, or it's not a, a sort of coincidence that the toad gets, um, gets these properties as opposed to, I don't know, a squirrel or some other animal. Um, but at the same time, it's not like uh, some sort of real um, observation of the toad and its properties that, uh, that sort of produces this fantastic image. It's this projection of the motor response of repulsion onto the, or externalization of this uh, repulsion onto the toad itself, as opposed to seeing it as a sort of subjective um, response of the of the person seeing the toad. So, are you saying it's not kind of instrumental? It's, it doesn't come from the toad itself. Then it seems like there is an element of that within this analysis. I would say. Um, yeah, I think yeah. So instrumental um, behavior is what I think we'll see a little bit later. Um, so yeah, instrumental behavior would be something like. Um, you know, recognizing that a toad has uh, venom in its skin and then, say, preventing your dog from trying to uh, lick the toad, which is something that my parents' dog that I 
sometimes take care of has done um, with comical results. Um, but uh, you you might sort of you know recognize properties of the toad and then um, make um, uh, decisions or or perform actions in response to those properties. Uh, but um, having this sort of exaggerated fear of the toad and you know worrying that it's going to spit venom at you and and so on. Um, this is uh, not an instrumental um, um, sort of response to properties of the toad. It's, it's again, this projection or externalization of our subjective uh, dispositions to action in response to the toad um, onto the toad as an external object. Uh, and, uh, and often these sort of phobic responses can be even the opposite of um, instrumental uh, in the sense. So like people that are afraid of heights, they have this often have like a sort of uh, panic response when they find themselves, uh, you know, in, near a cliff, for example. And that, that actually, of course, makes it more likely that they're going to fall than if they had a, a sort of calm response to the situation. Um, so, yeah, these full big responses are um, n not only are they not instrumental, but often they can be like counterproductive and, and make it more likely that you're going to suffer harm than if you responded in a uh, sort of objective way to the um, object or situation that you have this phobic response to. Okay, uh, let's go on to the the rest of this uh, section. Um, yeah, up to the next subsection break, if someone would like to read. I can read. Where are uh, these automatisms? Yes. These automatisms of amplification and projection could be uncovered, perhaps, in different aspects of collective myth and individual belief. Objects offered by the world as a screen for this amplificatory projection differ in time and space, but the fundamental dimensions of the activity it projects remain the same because the network of motivations fairly changes. At the very least, this network of motivations expresses conditions that are modified only slowly over time. In today's societies, the myth of man-eaters and children devourers tend to disappear as the fear of hunger as basic motivation tends to wane. The ogre, the carnivorous monster, or the beast eating flocks and shepherds, like the beast of Gévaudin, are images of the past. To fully imagine an ogre, one must feel hunger and be haunted by the desire to eat one's neighbors, as happened in the sieges of certain cities during the wars. However objectionable such a feeling may be, this tendency serves as a seed for the image of the ogre when it is amplified and projected outward, projected outside on a being with a human form and an insatiable hunger whose object of choice is human flesh. The Minotaur, the Morhout, more Morhu, of the Tristan and Isolde legend, ghouls, etc., represent the result of the same projection in different eras and in different cultural contexts. In other cases, the process of amplification continues to be exercised without producing a projection. In other words, no myth surfaces. There are neither man-eating toads nor devouring ogres, only a compulsive exaggeration of certain aspects of protection, preparation, and precautions. Ombre Dan, Ombre Dan analyzes a number of cases of compulsive exaggerations in his course on motivation and the problem of needs. A compulsion is a behavior undertaken by an individual without any other motivation than warding off the anxiety or guilt that would arise in the absence of the action. Compulsive exaggeration is the disproportional amplification of an activity that may originally have been a reasonable precaution. Exaggeration translates this effect of amplification linked to the a priori aspect of motor anticipations uh, and imagination and action. The fear of lacking food instead of being projected through ogre or images of monsters may be expressed in the indefinite hoarding of food supplies, sugar, salt, Certain aspects of greed may be interpreted as compulsive exaggerations. Umbradan points to people who never leave home without taking along a quote unquote, quote unquote, a just in case, onka, a small portable meal for mitigating the sudden deprivation of food, even if urban travel renders such precautions entirely futile. Umbradan also cites exaggerations in personal hygiene, the fight against microbes, etc. Certainly such behaviors have been noticed in mental illnesses, but they exist as well in non-pathological life and may take on a collective turn the point of, uh, to the point of becoming veritable, quote-unquote, quote patterns of culture. 
Each civilization amplifies certain defensive modes with corresponding exaggerations against poverty, disease, the transgression of certain norms, etc. This amounts to a collective imaginary projection in the form of mythical images complementing such exaggerated anticipation behaviors, the wandering Jew, the devil as tempter and seducer. Phenomena such as the arms race are, at least partially, of the order of amplification through compulsive exaggeration. They are correlated to mythical images of the enemy, the yellow or red peril, etc. In his film, Neighbors, McLaren has translated this phenomena of amplification and acceleration of rival and oppositional conducts. Mombardin indicates furthermore how rising anxiety recruits with increasing prematureness cues from an objective situation that might lead to a lack much earlier than the moment at which the lack becomes real. The fear of lacking air in a tunnel connected to claustrophobia accentuates the feel of traces of smoke or dust which indicate the confined character of a place's airflow. A psychosis of, quote, poor people deprived of clean air, unquote, is starting to develop in large cities where the composition of the atmosphere is far from indicating a danger of asphyxia. Could certain allergies be considered comparable to the amplificatory processes of defense activities? Certainly this is the case with regard to the effects, although the psychic aspect of the activity is failed in the case of allergies. While it is clear and conscious for compulsive exaggerations, which are accompanied by a plethora of justifications and reasons. I think all this follows pretty clearly from the first part of this section. Um, this notion that these uh, amplificatory projections can be collective and also historically dependent is, I think, very interesting. Um, that at different times or even at the same time in different societies, different mythical images or kind of collective compulsions may arise. Um, this idea of the, the people who never leave home without taking along a just in case, uh, just as a personal example, I had a, when I lived in New York, I had a boss who had been close to, in a building close to the World Trade Center um, on, you know, September 11th. And he and his coworkers apparently got stuck in an elevator. And so every time he, uh, for a long time, so every time he like left his office to go downstairs through the elevator, he would take a full bottle of water with him <laughs> um, because of this, the experience. Obviously, you know, th the elevator didn't commonly stop, but it was this uh, compulsive exaggeration based on that experience. Yeah, that's a, that's a good um, example because it's, so it's, in some respects, it's a rational response to uh, a situation that he actually lived through. Um, the uh, yeah, the experience of being stuck in an elevator and presumably, you know, lacking water. Um, uh, yeah, this was it, it's a sort of rational response to that. But then, of course, the the sort of prolongation of this response. Um, you know, most of the time, at ninety nine point whatever percent of time you take an elevator it doesn't get stuck and and so this um is probably a not a necessary um uh precaution to take um but again it's it's such a sort of small um behavior that it, it doesn't really sort of impede uh his life in any sort of noticeable way but there are people of course with um obsessive compulsive disorder who like you know, have to check that their stove is not on, you know, a hundred times a day or something like that. And and so they, they, they can't, can't leave the apartment because they are afraid that the stove is going to burn down the, the apartment when they're not there or something like that. Um, so here, this uh, amplification is not just a sort of quirk or, or, or you know, a strange habit or something, but it actually sort of takes over their whole life and they're not able to, to function uh, they can't, you know, work or you know, meet friends or do the, the things that anyone else does um, uh, because of their um, this amplification of this one fear or this one um, feeling that they have to do something. It, it just sort of takes over their whole life. So, uh, yeah, it, it has a sort of range of um, uh, importance, I guess, in the life of a person. It could be, yeah, just a, a sort of habit that the person has that doesn't really, you know, affect their life in any serious way, or it could be something that is uh, a, a cause of a lot of distress and, and suffering for the person. Yeah, and this bit about the uh, the ogre um, the as a sort of uh, projection, I thought was, um, yeah, a, a really um, insightful 
analysis of something that um, sort of bothers me about a lot of like horror movies and and horror literature and art in general um, now is that there are these sort of classic horror figures like werewolves, for example, that um, don't really have any relevance to our life today. Like people um, in you know living in cities have basically no interaction with wolves uh, and and this sort of image of the human being that transforms into a wolf um, uh, and and attacks other humans has like no sort of relevance to our lives as we live them today. It's just sort of an inherited um, sort of uh, artistic or literary trope that we sort of hold on to. But I think it makes sense in the context of uh, say medieval life where you actually do um, fear that your livestock will be attacked by wolves, and and then you uh, and and also you have a real experience of uh, going through hunger and starvation, uh, and then you know you can sort of imagine the situation of you know like the the siege of a of a town or a, a period of famine or whatever, and you start looking at your neighbor and thinking you know it might be desirable to actually eat your neighbor. Um, but then of course, sort of having a repulsion at this thought um, and sort of projecting it outwards and say, you know, saying that this is something that those sort of other creatures, those monsters do, but not something that I would do. Um, and, and so this is a, a, a sort of real experience for, um, for people in, in say medieval Europe or in other times and places in a way that it's not uh, real for us as you know viewers of a, a werewolf movie today um, so this is uh, I think a, a really um, a really good um, way of analyzing why some of these movies I think ha- are sort of shallow um, that they don't have like a lot of times they rely on just sort of jump scares and things like that to um, to uh, you know uh, evoke fear and have, don't have a, a very um, deep, I think, resonance in our psychical life in the way that, um, uh, I don't know, um, werewolf stories might have had more resonance in the life of someone who, you know, had actually lived through these kinds of experiences. Yeah, I think it's interesting that the beginning of this, um, this section we've just read, so he, he gives a kind of clear idea, a kind of metaphor for the projection. So he says the, uh, right at the beginning, objects offered by the world as a screen for this amplificatory projection, different. So it's he's kind of imagine it like a film, a film that's being projected onto an object. But he says the... Um, the objects change, but the underlying motivation might doesn't change or hardly change. It might change very slowly. And uh, one thought from that is that, in a sense, we have to search for the object. I mean, you're, what you're saying about the the in- inadequacy of films, uh, c- contemporary kind of horror films, say that the the image that they put forward for, for as the screen for the projection of the fear. If, which, you, which one which one may find unsatisfactory, which implies that there is there is a kind of a correct image. There is, there is a correct the screen uh, or the object. Sorry, that yeah, the object that acts as a screen somehow must conform better to the um, to the uh, the thing that motivates the pro- the projection in the first place. And I mean, in thinking in that way, one. One could imagine, one could perhaps say that that is the role of the auteur, the you know, the, the originator of this, perhaps. Yeah, I think, um, like Simondo points to some of the other sort of more realistic fears that we have in in sort of contemporary Western societies, and um, you know, fears of poverty, fear of disease, as is of course a prominent one now uh, in the last few years. Um, you know, fears that um, that we really fear like that are part of our, our lives, um, I think have more um, resonance for us than, you know, a fear of being attacked by a, a wolf creature is, is not really something that we um, sort of experience in our lives. And uh, yeah, so one of the roles of, uh, yeah, the, the creator of a film, the, the screenwriter or director and, and or the actors all together, um, is precisely to sort of evoke some of these um, projections. It doesn't necessarily have to be a fear, um, but these sort of uh, images that we have in relation to um, our 
our motor behavior and our sort of externalization of those images onto a person or onto an object, um, you know, tapping into those sort of collective projections onto objects and, uh, uh, you know, putting them into uh, into a form that we can experience collectively, I think, is uh, is one of the rules that um, that yeah, uh, artistic creation and in particular film creation has of uh, uh, yeah, allowing us to sort of access those um, those elements of our psychical life in a way that we wouldn't necessarily be able to do without you know experiencing the film or the other artwork. I wonder if if some of these uh, images are are not necessarily necessarily like bi-univocal in the sense that you know something like um, like a werewolf, which may have had its origin in collective fears of literal wolves or, uh, I don't know, roving um, like bandits in the Hundred Years' War or something like that, um, can be repurposed to express fears of like losing control or something like that. And maybe part of the success of uh, like contemporary movie um that a contemporary horror movie on the basis of something like you know one of these monsters um depends on the director kind of repurposing the image so that it responds to contemporary fears yeah that's a good point oh sorry go ahead no, 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 I was just wanting to say that I think that's something that uh, maybe can be seen in the story of Frankenstein, like as the monster before, kind of transforming into uh, contemporary zombie films that I think kind of uh, really managed to mirror this, uh, I don't know, like wild movements of uh, the market and everything and viruses uh, and stuff like that. So I don't know, because uh, the original story of like Frankenstein was him being born kind of you know, like from this fear of people at that time being afraid of public dissections and the subjugation of their bodies and so on. And uh, I think it, I don't know, like the contemporary zombie version of this kind of, I think, shows how these fears shifted and uh, how they evolved in this, like, from this, like, one figure into this, like, mass uh, and stuff like that. So I don't know. It's maybe like an interesting thing. And also one more thing uh, I don't know where I have read it, but I think it's also Im- interesting to see how these myths take shape outside of like our Euro-Atlantic zone, sort of. And I, I remember I've reading somewhere uh, about uh, certain certain new mythologies that arise in certain regions in Africa. I think where people, for example, imagine ATMs coming alive, you know, spitting money and like eating people and stuff like that. So I don't know, that's also just like, an, uh, it's interesting to see how in certain regions, uh, there is still the capacity to imagine completely new uh, <laughs> mystical beings like that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I know that, um, like, there are places where accusations of uh, sorcery are like real, you know, uh, parts of people's lives that like, you know, you if you um, become sort of a prominent person, uh, in politics or business or whatever, and someone accuses you of of being a a witch, um, that can you know have a real consequence on your life. It's not just some sort of uh, uh, you know weird story on Facebook or whatever. But um, um, yeah, and I think in our own societies, um, yeah, that we have you know the phenomenon of urban legends that um, you know um, well, there was the one like uh, what is it about like the gang that goes around and flashes their headlights at you. And then if you flash back, they attack you or something like that. Um, um, yeah. So there's these sort of urban legends about like, um, uh, you know, fears of urban crime uh, or, um, you know, things that people actually fear now. But I think, yeah, this idea of transformation of images is a, an interesting one because um, yeah, like maybe I'm a little bit too, um, I was a little bit too quick to sort of dismiss the the image of the werewolf because yeah the, the fact that these films are successful shows that they are um tapping into something uh or you know that that audiences are responding to these, this image in some uh in some way that uh, is satisfying at least to them um uh, and uh yeah so i think yeah something like um the fear of transformation of uh of your body and sort of losing control of your body um that that's something that is potentially at work uh and i know a lot of uh vampire movies have um sort of uh um 
connected with uh, you know fears around um, AIDS and you know blood uh, and uh, transmission of diseases through blood and so on. Um, so this is something that obviously is uh, sort of a contemporary transformation of the vampire uh, myth into uh, you know putting contemporary fears into this um, old image. Um, and yeah, so I think it would be interesting to look at um, you know what what sort of transformations images undergo in relation to um, contemporary or, or, you know, historical changes in the types of fears that, or the types of uh, uh, affective responses that people, um, that people have to various situations, you know, where an image might be created in response to one situation and then undergo transformation and be used in response to a completely different situation. Uh, I have a question. Uh... In New Zealand, you know, like a collective dance move called Haka, like when um, some kind of games uh, start and there's like a, a that kind of dance move uh, together. So my question is that <clears throat> if Haka can be, a, cannot be an example of this case, then there is a difference between like unconscious uh, reaction and then unconscious reaction. And then Haka uh, must be a de- designed, uh, manipulated, collectively manipulated dance moves. So um, what do you think about that? Like Haka can be an example of this case? Yeah, I think like, any sort of, um, sort of uh, performance that has a public character. So yeah, the Haka is, uh, I guess, in part meant to sort of intimidate your opponents and sort of demonstrate your collective uh, unity and coordination and so on. Um, um, anything that has this similar sort of character of, uh, yeah, intimidating your, your opponent um, uh, or, or um, demonstrating some sort of properties, um, I, think, um, I think that might um, sort of fit this idea of, um, yeah, amplification of motor behaviors. Um, yeah, I think that, that makes sense. No, thank you. Let's go on to, uh, let's see. Yeah, let's read um, a page or so into the next section, um, if someone else would like to read. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, number two, particular aspects of images and a state of fear doubling. Negative expectation, fear, has its own mode of image organisation. It was carefully studied and described by Lucretius, who sought to use philosophical thought and the critical spirit as a means of delivering humanity from the effects of fear, that is, the images it engenders and the exaggerations it produces. According to Lucretius, the fundamental fear afflicting humans is that of death. All related fears, for for instance, of disease and poverty, are but indirect to minor aspects of of the reaction towards the threat of death. The essential character of the fear of death lies in its effect on the imagination, the doubling of the self. A person sees himself standing next to his own corpse, lamenting the poor dead person, almost as, as though we, were, uh, we, we see a dead friend. This imaginary and illusory doubling leads to a feeling of great sorrow by anticipation, for we presume that a time will come when we will be a corpse, one in which consciousness and sensibility will be preserved. Lucretius opposes and denounces such doubling since, according to strict atomistic materialism, as soon as humans die, the atoms, molecules that compose them, disperse. The soul which exists only as the gathering of lighter atoms within the corporeal envelope disperses and consciousness disappears. Because the connective forces that made the living compound have ceased to exist, nothing remains of this compound but components as scattered after death as they were before birth. The nothingness after it is perfectly analogous to the nothingness before. Before our birth, we need neither felt. After our death, we will neither feel nor be conscious. Not enough to, it's not enough to describe the illusion of imagination stimulated by fear. It is necessary to analyse its effects to combat them. Uh, when an animal fears, when an animal fears, it absorbs its fear in a flight reaction. Humans know in advance the uselessness of flight when danger is omnipresent, such as in a storm. Deprived of refuge in the physical world, humans then invent a transcendent alternative in a more powerful being. They force the image of God so that they may then petition them. In reality, it is still from out of themselves that humans operate this doubling by positing outside of themselves the image of an, anal- of an analogous but more powerful being. 
The trouble is that after the dangers passed, the double actualized and materialized image remains, threatening humans from the heavens to appease its wrath. It must be worship. Uh, it must be worshipped, honoured. It must be offered, wreck, offered wretched, bloody, and criminal sacrifices like that of Iphigenia. Iphigenia. In sum, with this doubling that allows them temporarily to appease their fear, humans have lost their freedom. They have become alienated, to use the expression Feuerbach would later take up. Religion is the superstitious fear linked to this actualized and ritualized image and the rituals connected to it. The analysis of Lucretius, echoed by Horace, leads to seeing the supernatural as a set of images drawn from reality and human life, illusorily aggrandized and severed. In order to serve as support to the act of supplication of the sacrifice and rituals to which humans are led by fear. Right, so this section is um, taking up themes from Lucretius. Uh, and, and Lucretius is someone that Simon Don um, uh, refers to quite a bit, actually. Um, um, we, we saw this, um, he, does, he has a, a fairly extensive analysis of Lucretius in his text, History of the Notion of the Individual, that we read in uh, uh, Individuation Volume 2. Um, and, and here he's talking about Lucretius's sort of theory of the origin of religion. Um, so um, Lucretius holds, uh, and so he's a, a good Epicurean. He thinks that there are gods. Um, they're just um, sort of composite entities that exist outside of, between the, uh, the worlds. Um, and, and so they, uh, they don't actually care about anything that we do. They, they don't sort of... Um, send us suffering or gifts or um, want us to worship them or anything like that. They're just these entities that exist outside of our world and uh, don't have any interest in, in us. Uh, but then, so the question is, where does this idea that the gods care about our actions, where does this come from? And Lucretius uh, sort of grounds all of this in the fear of death um, and this, um, this sort of imaginary um, doubling of the self that uh, that happens in our, our depiction of death. So we imagine ourselves as the corpse and then also as, you know, the person standing next to the corpse and, and mourning uh, the our own death. Um, so we, we think of, you know, all the things that we never got the chance to do or experience or whatever. Um, uh, and, and so we, we sort of split ourselves into the dead person and the person mourning the dead person. And of course, for Epicureans and, and for Lucretius in particular, um, we uh, death is just the annihilation of the person. So in the same way that we had no experience before we were born, we will have no experience after our death. And, and so there's the, the sort of famous formula uh, that the Epicureans used uh, that um, where death is, I am not. And where I am, death is not. Um, you shouldn't fear death because after you die, you just don't exist anymore. And so there's nothing to actually fear. Um, and, uh, and so for Lucretius, this fear of death and this doubling of the self that we sort of imagine is, uh, is the, the root of our um, fear of all these other situations like poverty or disease um, that uh, will potentially lead to an untimely death. Um, and uh, in particular, these fears of situations where we have no recourse or no way of protecting ourselves, like the thunderstorm. Um, these are the situations where um, we not only have the doubling of ourselves, but the doubling of the danger outside of ourselves. So there's the sort of empirical phenomenon, the thunderstorm. Um, and uh, and then there's the, the, the God that brings about the thunderstorm, uh, which is the sort of double image of the of the thunderstorm itself so um we imagine the thunderstorm as being split into yeah the the actual storm itself and then the the god that is responsible for the storm and uh and then after the storm is over we feel like we need to um the the this sort of doubled image uh persists and then we we feel the need to um supplicate this god that brings about thunderstorms and and try to ensure that the thunderstorm doesn't come back uh and so this for lucretius is sort of the genesis of religion is these um experiences of of terror and um the uh sort of desire to supplicate the entity that is bringing about this terrifying situation and uh and and so one of the purposes of philosophy uh, in general is to sort of um uh, demystify 
these situations and give us a physical explanation for you know how a thunderstorm happens um, that allows us to see that it's not some some god that is um, you know sending this thunderstorm to us as a punishment for not worshiping it properly or whatever. Uh, it's just this sort of physical event that has no actual relevance to uh, human action and uh, and that we can respond to in a rational way. Uh, and so this is in general sort of the the strategy of Epicurean philosophy is to provide us with causal explanation of phenomena that allow us to uh, experience the world um, in a rational way and and not have this sort of fear and mythological projection of that fear into a, a, a separate entity that would uh, require our worship. And uh, Lucretius is someone, yeah, as I, as I said, uh, Simon Don, um has a, an extensive discussion of Lucretius in the history of the notion of the individual. Um, and, uh, you know, when we, when we read that a few months ago, I, I went back and, and reread Lucretius. And um, I have to say, he's a, he's a really powerful writer. Um, you know, there's, there's some things in his work that obviously um, don't really line up with our contemporary scientific understanding of, of the phenomenon in question. Um, like he, uh, he has this, um, he has this um, uh, account of the soul, like the soul is just, um, you know, th there is a soul, um, but it's just composed of these light atoms that suffuse the body. Um, and after our death, they sort of dissipate outside of our body. Um, and so, of course, this is not a, an account that lines up with our contemporary understanding of how human uh, sort of mental and emotional life um, work. Uh, but there are other phenomena, like he uh, he has, a, I think, a pretty accurate um, understanding of the hydrological cycle, like the way that water is evaporated out of the ocean and then travels in the form of clouds and then is rained down onto uh, the ground and then uh, eventually flows in the form of rivers and streams and returns to the ocean and, and repeats the cycle. He, he describes this this cycle in pretty much the same terms as, as you know, a contemporary textbook of meteorology would. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's, um, um, I think, a lot of really valuable stuff that uh, we can take up from, from Lucretius and, and this sort of general um, approach of, you know, understanding the world um, in a way that allows us to not have this fear of, uh, you know, that we're being punished or rewarded. Um, I think this is a, a really valuable aspect of Lucretius that Simon Don wants to um, sort of take up as well, even if he doesn't adopt a lot of the uh, sort of mechanical explanations that Lucretius proposes. So let's go on to the uh, next bit. Uh, we can read the rest of this subsection, I believe. Yeah, that should be good. Uh, so if someone would like to read from there. I, I can do it. Is it a, as a compliment starting? Uh, sorry, just a sec. Uh, yes. Okay. As a compliment, Lucretius proposes methods aimed at countervailing the power of the imagination with its miracles and illusions, robbing humans of freedom, especially in the amorous passions. There is a kind of medicine of the passions that is sketched through the intermediary of an objective representation of nature. Epicurean, ep, <laughs> Epicurean wisdom aims to provide the individual with an exact knowledge of his own limits and also real but very modest needs. All that is required is to avoid pain and to satisfy natural and necessary needs. We might say that Epicurean wisdom consists in giving to the present its full plentitude by not allowing it to be devoured by the forces of the imagination, which constantly anticipate and wrench humans from the present in order to launch them on a quest for all that is not given in actuality. Instead of being at rest in the limits of their present, humans explore the seas fee, fi, fee for power. Sorry, I don't know <laughs> how this is correctly. Uh, yeah, fee for power and desire wealth, thereby depleting their own wealth. The short time they have for living, for living. Imagination is a force that wrenches one from the present, prevents rest in the state of ataraxia, and pulls one towards the anticipated future and realities that present sensations do, do not give. The imagination has the power to make humans strangers to the present situation and indifferent uh, to what they are actually given, as if it wasn't really theirs. In contemporary, or at least recent terms, we might say that the image alters sensation, de de 
denatures it, diminishing the force of the present that is the basis of wisdom. To fight against the image as a power of anticipation, Lucretius was in fact led to recognize the projection effect that characterizes it. Yet doubling seems very specifically linked to negative states of expectation, implying fear. The apparent independence of the image, severed from the subject while expressing the subject, corresponds to a barrier that the subject constructs between himself and the reality posited by doubling. With fear, the subject installs himself inside a retrenched camp erected with the means at his disposal. The future is foreign because it is outside. The world is dichotomized into inside and outside because the emergence of the barriers result from a defensive and expulsive mo movement. Even the gods, imagined to fight threatening realities, are foreign to the present human to the present human order of the subject since they lie beyond the defensive barrier. The point of departure is the defensive gesture separating the near from the far, installing defenses to preserve the near, doubling in some fashion the subject in order to send an emissary of himself in the guise of a more powerful god to fight the threatening adver adversity in the outside camp. To fight outside of the retrenched camp, the subject has sent out another self that takes away some of its reality, thus creating the beginning of alienation, which is, at base, dualization. Yeah, so again, he's, uh, he's sort of building on Lucretius here. Um, and um, yeah, so there's this Epicurean notion that um, we just have to, uh, you know, and again, there's, there's the, the sort of folk Epicurean idea that like Epicureanism is, is all about, um, you know, eating and drinking and being merry and, and all that. But it's actually the actual um, ethics of Epicureanism was all about moderation. And uh, there are certain you, you, you um, have to satisfy your sort of basic needs of, you know, food and, and shelter and so on. Um, uh, but you should avoid um, the sort of search for infinite pleasure. This was um, another theme in Lucretius that um, we we um, we seek these infinite pleasures, like the 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 quest for wealth, the quest for power, all these things. We we always want more and more of whatever the entity, the um, aspect of reality is that we're seeking. Um, we um, but this kind of infinite search for, for pleasure or uh, this, you know, infinite acquisition of wealth, for example, will never satisfy us. We'll always have this desire for more. Um, and, and so we should uh, instead uh, restrict our desires. Um, we should um, only desire to satisfy our uh, necessary needs and, and not seek pleasure in these sort of infinite, uh, never-ending quests. Uh, and so this is sort of the um, this is sort of the Epicurean ethics that Lucretius proposes, uh, or or he doesn't uh, introduce it, but um, expounds, I guess. Um, and in particular, it's the role of the imagination that Lucretius sees as dangerous. Um, so he talks about how uh, you know again in in your um, quest for wealth, you always imagine you know I I could have an even bigger golden chain or an even bit nicer car or whatever other sort of, um, you know, aspect of wealth, you can always have a, a bigger one or a, a better one or a, a newer one or whatever. Um, so you, you always imagine um, more and more wealth that you could have. Um, and, uh, and so this, um, no matter how much wealth you actually do acquire, you can always uh, imagine yourself having more. And, and this imagination sort of pushes you onwards to um, to always feel unsatisfied with what you actually have. Uh, and he, he talks about this in relation to um, love or uh, lust, I guess, um, that you, you always sort of um, have this imagination of, uh, um, you know, this infinite pleasure. Um, your um, imaginary perfect partner will, you know, provide the, the, this uh, infinite amount of pleasure. Um, but uh yeah, we, we should sort of restrain our imaginations instead and uh, be satisfied with what we have. Um, uh, that's sort of the Epicurean um, relation to the imagination. And he sees uh, fear, as, as Simonon points out, fear is the, sort of the, the um, most powerful uh, element of the imagination, or it's in relation to fear that we have the most powerful um, imaginary um, uh, sort of 
projections uh, like the ones that we discussed uh, in the last section on uh, you know the the fear of the thunderstorm, for example. But um, uh, the other emotions are capable of bringing about this kind of um, exteriorization as well. But uh, in the relation to fear, we have this doubling of the subject and then a sort of splitting or sort of complementary to this is a kind of splitting of the subject into two domains. And, and we, we sort of um, take a part of ourselves and posit it outside of ourselves uh, is sort of the abstract description of what's going on. Um, so we, we, we have this fear of, um, uh, of pain or death or whatever, and then we separate that fear from ourselves and, and sort of make it into something outside of ourselves that we then have to um, relate to uh, by, you know, worshiping or, or supplicating or, or whatever. Um, uh, so this sort of externalization and splitting is, um, yeah, the, the sort of root of alienation, uh, which is, again, not, not a word that Lucretius uses, but one that Feuerbach uses um, to describe the, the way that religion um, sort of separates humans from, uh, from themselves and splits them into something outside of themselves. Okay, uh, so let's go on to the next section. If someone could read, uh, this one's a shorter section, so if we could, someone could read the, actually, I think maybe I'll read uh, if, uh, if that's okay. Um, so yeah, I'll read this section. Oh, I have the French one again. Um, let me read the English one. Um, okay, so subsection three, the image and positive states of expectation. When states of expectation are positive, implying desire and active seeking, the image still corresponds to an amplifying projection, but no doubling occurs here because the dichotomy of the near and far is no longer postulated. The positive state of expectation acts through the suppression of obstacles in real distance. Positive desire constitutes images according to a relation of imminence, an inversion of the transcendence produced by fear. Lucretius's analysis may not apply to all the gods of the ancient. Not all were to the same degree those that were invoked out of fear and to whom bloody sacrifices were offered. Beneath the distant official re religion of the polis, initiation cults developed, providing more meaning for the inner reflective life in quotidian thought than for collective ceremonies. Moreover, fear is not only the potent is not the only potent motivation that can stimulate the desire to address an image. Sorrow over one's lost ones, the wish of being reunited with them and living among them, was an equally powerful motivation. To pass from the state of present separation to a new future meeting amounts to finding the way that leads to hell in order, like Orpheus, to seek Eurydice and bring her back to the light. Voyages, paths, passages, purifications, and expectations draw their meaning from relinking what was severed and finding a mediation where death has severed the link. Hope seeks passages and prepares a voyage. The images of hope do not seek rupture as a mode of defense. They do not posit a transcendence, but rather trace the path of a continuity between the shores of the living and the dead. It is the subject who must transform and purify himself to be worthy of the voyage. The beyond begins in the now and with the first steps. Mediation, the imminence of revelation, the fate of the divine through the human and in the form of human existence. This is what is found in early Christianity as a religion of hope. The very idea of incarnation and the image of nativity summarize this movement, which is the opposite of alienation. The divinity may be here, he kept nunc in the straw and on the wood, like this board on which we place our hands. Nativity is the image of the absence of distance of the divine. Like the life of a child, the divinity begins here. The word imminence, in fact, is not quite suitable to express this genesis without hiatus, for imminence seems to look seems to lock up and contain what is imminent. Anticipation through hope begins a, brings a continuity with regard to the present that is like a birth. The dimension of eternity, too, takes on a different sense as anticipation of a personal future in individual religions of hope. Personal eternity is a new life, a resurrection, symbolized by mourning and the flame as we see in the lanterns for the dead topped with a rooster in the Germigny Cemetery near Orléans. Palingenesis and resurrection belong to modes of anticipation where present reality is never defined, never irreversible. Even death is not an absolute boundary or barrier. The anticipation of reincarnation or resurrection goes beyond death, reconnecting temporal continuity to one's first existence. It is impossible to sketch even summarily the richness and diversity of the images through which various peoples have invoked a future life. There is, however, considering the beliefs of antiquity, a beautiful and wise book by uh, Franz Cumont, Lux Perpetua. Right, so um, this is a, a sort of um, supplement to the, the last set of, uh, of or the last uh, discussions. Um, there's um, another set of uh, religious ideas in the ancient Mediterranean world that doesn't really fit the Lucretian model of religion. Uh, and this is the mystery cults or the initiatory um, religions, uh, so the Orphic cults and so on. Um, 
Um, so these uh, were sort of um, uh, supplements to the official state religion of uh, the different um, uh, city-states of the Mediterranean world. Uh, so in, in Greece and Rome and um, I think other parts of the Mediterranean world as well, there were these um, initiatory religions. So they were sort of um, officially they were secret. Uh, so you weren't allowed to reveal the mysteries of these um, religions. Uh, like you can't sort of publicly describe what the rituals consist in and so on. Even though, of course, um, a, a large portion of the community were members of these um, initiatory religions. And so they, you know, they knew very well what the, the rituals consisted in. Um, but uh, so it's, it's sort of the opposite of the, there's the public religion where you build, you know, temples and perform these sort of public ceremonies and so on. And then there's this secret religion um, or so sort of open secret religion um, that, that is the complement to it. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, this, this is what these um, Orphic and other um, uh, mystery religions consisted in. And, uh, and Simon Don is sort of uh, connecting these kinds of um, initiatory religions, not to the fear of death, but to the desire to be reunited with our um, loved ones who have died. Uh, and so this is a, another sort of um, source of images that, uh, yeah, all sorts of, uh, he, he mentions sort of in passing this notion of the, the, um, uh, this image of the the rooster on the on this uh, in a cemetery. Um, so the rooster, of course, um, uh, crows at dawn and, and sort of wakes everyone up. And, and then so the the image here is that you know there's a, a sort of spiritual awakening or or a resurrection that will happen um, in the future where the the dead will be reawakened and uh, reborn. Um, and so there's all kinds of images that various peoples around the world have used uh, throughout history of, uh, you know, that corresponds to resurrection of the dead or reuniting with the dead. This is really interesting because I went to a um, exhibition uh, that had a bunch of Kofun period Haniwa, which are basically these uh, tomb ornaments made of clay. But one of the, uh, you know, museum placards said that the the chicken or rooster haniwa um the the theory is that they represented a a sort of control over time um i guess because the rooster crows uh you know like crows at the break of day but it's uh, seems similar to this um where where does he talk about the rooster oh yeah the lanterns for the dead topped by a rooster and I don't know, this sense of hopefulness for uh, the afterlife. I'll post a picture of the honey one in the chat. Yeah, I think this is, again, uh, uh, an instance where you can have the same image um, with um, different um, or, you know, in this case, related, but uh, somewhat different um, um, sort of uh, affective motor content. Um, so, yeah, the rooster in one society can can be related to the resurrection uh you know in in the sort of image of reawakening the dead as if they're asleep uh and then maybe in another society it has to do with um yeah the order of time and the way that the the rooster uh, uh calling in the morning sort of sets the the time for the day or something like that um yeah i don't know the specifics of of this um use of the rooster image in in japan um but uh um yeah, it's interesting that we can have um, you know, the same image and even in this case, a similar sort of um, uh, affective domain, like they're connected with the hope for being reunited with the dead or, or for reawakening the dead, but um, maybe in a different, the sort of uh, details of how this image works might be different. Um, so yeah, the, it, it, I guess shows the um, uh, variety that images can can take on in different societies even in the same affective domain so i i put it in chat but uh robert graves wrote this book he's a poet slash anthropologist in big quotation marks around anthropologist from britain in the mid 20th century he writes this book uh the white goddess and a lot of stuff in it is interesting but questionably accurate but he has this really interesting theory about sort of like uh, how even though practitioners might have known all of the kind of 
public rituals and performances and ceremonies and stories specific religion. It was only sort of like the highest level of priests that the sort of almost semiotic system behind them, the, the, the signs and signifiers, the what the stories were trying to represent beyond simply stories. Like uh, we see, for instance, in the Bible, a lot of stuff in, in like Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers, a lot of those laws are sort of just like basic survival in the desert stuff. Like don't eat animals that are rotten with parasites. Here's how you crossbreed strong livestock and stuff like that. But it's sort of like hidden behind uh, religion to to make it like transmissible. Yeah, and there's there's always um, a lot of different functions that are sort of combined together in in yeah in what we sort of know as religion. So this Lucretian story of you know religion coming from fear, um, I think there's some truth in it. Um, I think you know that we can we can see um, you know the role of fear in in sort of uh, motivating religion but um it's probably a uh, over simplification and um yeah there's, there's all kinds of other aspects like uh the one simon don't points out here the this hope for resurrection or hope for being reunited with the dead um and yeah just sort of um uh behavioral um uh i don't know practices i guess um like yeah things like how to um how to divide property after someone dies, how to um, build a house, how to uh, keep your livestock, all these sort of um, everyday practices can be um, sort of regulated in religious terms as well. Um, so uh, yeah, all these, um, all these different aspects get sort of combined together and influence each other in extremely complicated ways. Um, so uh, yeah, re religion as a sort of aspect of social life and affective life and everything um yeah the, there's obviously much more to it than just what lucretius um uh emphasizes and i'm taken by the um the uh, um the kind of dimensions of time that seem to be within this narrative the kind of notions for example eternity how it becomes like a personal eternity in relation to religion and things like that I mean, the other thing that brings to mind, though, is that myth, um, I think with the rise of philosophy, myth is something that's questioned as, and it's spoken about as like stories, stories people tell to kind of make sense of the world, and the implication of which is obviously is that they're not true. Um, there's an interesting bit in uh, volume one of Individuation, where he talks in, in the part about psychical individuation, he talks about um, this phrase from Spinoza, um, sentimos experimorque uh, nos eternos esse, um, we, we feel and we experience that we are eternal. Um, and so Simon Don talks about this sort of feeling of eternity or this um, inner experience of eternity that we have um, at, at the same time as we also have this um, sort of experience or, or knowledge that, um, you know, the world will go on after we die and, and we won't be there to experience it. Uh, um, and so how we have these sort of both aspects, both experiences at the same time and how um, uh, religion, for example, but also art and various other aspects of human, um, you know, societies and cultures uh, sort of uh, maybe emphasize one side over the other or combine them in various ways or, or try to account for the, this apparent contradiction between the two. Um, and uh yeah, so the this notion of a, a personal existence um, after death is, of course, a very um, affectively important one. Like, in some sense, of course, you know, after you die, your body is still around. So there's some there's some part of you or some aspect of you that does survive after or that does continue to exist after death. Um, all the atoms that make up your body um, you know, are still there. They just sort of have a different configuration and they might get taken up by worms that eat your your flesh or whatever um uh but uh yeah the the so you're, you're there's something about you that does um persist after death but that's not what we sort of really think of as you know personal um existence after death we want to what we what we want to have is you know a, a sort of existence in which me as a person like my thoughts and feelings and desires and all this um continues after death um 
And, and so this is sort of the, what we hope for when we hope for resurrection or um, eternal life or something along those lines. Um, so somehow our, our sort of inner experience uh, or our feeling of uh, eternity gets um, transposed into this personal form. Uh, and and we, we sort of think about ourselves as existing after our death. And uh, yeah, that's um, sort of one aspect of this desire for eternity is, is the personalization of eternity, uh, as, you, uh, as you pointed out. Yeah, I mean, it also makes me think of uh, like Plato, for example, the kind of notion of ideas and the belief in the soul and things like this, which kind of place the essence outside of the, the bodily, shall we say. So in that sense, it does allow, um, it does allow for uh, um, an, yeah, an eternal existence, shall we say. I mean, I think, I think it's Nietzsche, I can't remember who says that Christianity is kind of play, is a continuation of Platonism, basically. Yeah, um, so Plato has, I mean, there's, of course, with Plato, it's always difficult to um, sort of pin him down because his texts are, that we have are, besides the possibly apocryphal letters, there are, um, they're all dialogues. So we have these personalities. Sometimes Socrates speaks uh, and gives us uh, an account, and we can sort of assume that that may be Plato's own position, but not always. Um, uh, but yeah, there are aspects or there are places in Plato where he describes the existence of the soul after death and before birth. Um, uh, the Phaedo, I believe, uh, or maybe the Phaedrus, I can get those two mixed up. Um, but uh, um, yeah, the the idea of the soul as having some relation, uh, there, there's this line about the soul as the sister of the forms. Um, the soul uh, sort of has this essential relationship to the realm of ideas, which are eternal. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have this, this kind of um, relationship to the ideas uh, to the realm of the eternal, uh, and then death is, to some extent, uh, a liberation of the soul from the realm of the changing of, of what comes to be and passes away, uh, and uh, sort, of, sort of a return to the realm of uh, being, of, of what is eternally. Um, and uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, sort of resonance of this idea uh, in Christianity, and, and there were a number of um, uh, sort of neo-Platonist, uh, quasi-religious practices in the early centuries AD um, that likely sort of fed into Christianity or were connected to Christianity in various ways. Um, sometimes they were rivals to Christianity as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so they were neo-Platonist groups that um, sort of um, had this uh, idea of yeah the soul returning to the realm of the ideas after death and, and returning to eternity after death and, uh, you know, having various um, semi-religious, I guess, semi-magical practices related to, you know, ensuring that your soul would be returned to um, the realm of eternity after your death. Uh, and, and so, yeah, like what in, in Plato is um, seemingly an intellectual doctrine um, gets sort of transformed into a religious doctrine uh, in, uh, in later development. We're just about at time, and the next section is a longer one. So I think it's probably a good place to stop for today, uh, if that's okay with everyone. Um, okay, yeah, so let's, I'm not hearing any objections, so let's stop here, uh, and we'll pick up from uh, subsection four uh, on page 49 of the translation. Um, we'll continue, uh, yeah, we'll continue there next time. All right, so uh, thanks everyone okay, for coming when, out, when, and uh, I hope to see you. Yeah, I'll just I'll sounds good because you thanks, mentioned no, thanks, um, there is going to be a Sorry, break ahead, at, at some point. Can you just remind us when that will be, please? Thank you. Oh yes, uh, let me just turn the recording off. Right, well, we can keep the recording going. I think. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be traveling um, at the second half of April, so the 16th and the 23rd. Um, I won't be able to um, to meet um, those weeks. Um, I should be able to meet on the 30th. Um, I'll be back then, but, you know, potentially if, if you know, jet lag has messed up my schedule, maybe not. But I, the 30th, I'll, I'll put in an event for the 30th before I leave. Um, and, uh, and we can plan to meet on the 30th unless something comes up. Uh, but yeah, so the 16th and the 23rd, I'll be away. Uh, but uh, what I suggested last time we can, we can do is um, um, 
yeah, if you, anyone who um, has not read Individuation Volume 1 might want to take a look at it, or um, if you have read it, you might want to go back and, uh, and you know, see if you can, like, make any connections with the, uh, with what we're reading now and, or, you know, bring up points that we haven't looked at and, and so on, and then we can sort of discuss it over the, over the chat while I'm away. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's our plan for now, um, unless anyone else has, like, objections or other ideas, uh, you can put them in the, in the chat, and, uh, and we can discuss that over the next couple of weeks. Um, so, yeah, thanks again, everyone, and uh, see you next week.